It is our 10th episode. Hard to believe that we've been doing this now 10 weeks. And I guess it shows that, well, I think we started this a week or two after I was quarantined in Philly. So I am approaching the third month of being in home quarantined and being around areas that are shut down. But as we hit our 10th episode, a lot of the country is starting to open up including some areas that initially we thought were not going to open up, at least for sports teams in New York and California. So as we kind of begin this week, let's look at areas that you have seen or or you believe to be progress. I know that there was a report that there isn't enough testing going on right now. I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing or if it's a bad thing, but that there are actually too many tests for people now, as opposed to initially there was a shortage of tests. So I imagine we've made some progress since places can reopen and we've seen Florida, for example, open and there hasn't been a huge or even many setbacks at all. So I would imagine that is a probably a good place to start when we look at progress that areas have reopened and we haven't seen any major setbacks. No, I think that that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, the testing is going to be an issue until we settle down on a standard, meaning a gold standard for which all the other tests can be compared to. Um, and then, of course, the process of the test itself, um, we have to understand a little better because some of that, which is very common right now in terms of the testing, um, is uh, looking at viral particles versus act- actually active viruses. So we're, we're, um, we're ramping up. There's no question that there's a lot more tests available now than they were before. Uh, our big issue is going to be um, having a sufficient supply of uh, the rapid testing. I know that there are some now that are in-home testing, but they're not as rapid as should be. But clearly that's where you want to be um, at some point is having sufficient amount of uh, rapid uh, testing uh, that you can, um, again, get your results right away rather than waiting a few days. Um, there's no question that the country is starting to open up. Um, there are going to be some uh, major issues, I think. Most of them are going to be around uh, child care as well as the school issues uh, in terms of opening. And I think although there is a small amount of uh, reports in terms of the pediatric population, the children in terms of being affected or infected or carriers, um, I don't think that that's going to be a major issue. Looking at, as as we've done in the past, uh, our interviews, looking at the other countries, the European countries, uh, as a uh, as a model, um, some of the Scandinavian countries have opened their schools. Uh, clearly, it's not the same as it was before. There is some distancing. There's a certainly a lot more control in terms of uh, making sure that uh, people are not coming in sick. But um, again, it's not showing that there is a significant uh, recurrence. Now, the big issue, of course, is the size of crowds, uh, which I think, uh, um, in my mind, really affects sport events more than anything else. Uh, There are also probably concerts and and theaters, but I think from from the size of the crowds, the largest would be in terms of sports events. Um, Those are still going to be a challenge, uh, both in terms of making sure that people who are sick don't come in, but also in terms of how are you going to space things. Uh, Air travel is going to be very similar to that because, again, we're looking at a very large number of people once that gets ramped up. I think um, overall that uh, what's encouraging for everyone is the fact that things are opening, not as quickly as we'd like it, uh, and that we're not seeing pockets of... uh, of, again, surges of infected people. I think that that's really the uh, encouraging uh, point. To this Why do you think that's the case, that areas have been able to reopen? Even Florida, where there was speculation that it was too soon, Arizona, another state, and a little later than Florida, so we still have some time to see, but 
Florida keeps being used, especially in social media pockets, as the example of when somebody says, well, you're opening up too soon or you're reopening up too soon. Well, look at Florida. They opened and you don't have any issues. People were back on the beaches and things along those lines. So what do you attribute that to? Well, I, the, I attribute the fact that um, even in Florida, the opening is not, it's a stepwise approach. It's not uh, just a, f- a flood uh, or turning it on with a key. Uh, so have been a stepwise approach. There are still recommendations of social distancing, despite the fact that the beaches are open. Uh, there's a lot more, clearly a lot more commerce activity at this point. Restaurants are opening. Uh, but the, as you know, the restaurants are not opening at 100%. Right. So again, there is some of the caution that's there. I think, uh, again, f- taking from some of the medical principles, um, when something is at risk in medicine, uh, the fact that you take the risk and nothing happens does not mean that the risk is gone. The risk is there. You were just lucky. Uh, and sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that risk that you took um, again, ended up in your favor this time, but it doesn't mean that if you repeat yourself that you're not going to get into trouble. And I think right now, despite the fact that things are being pushed to open more widely than we see, we there is still in the air that sense of caution. Right. And um, I think that it's either individual or from some states. Uh, I know the state of Massachusetts is way behind other states in terms of opening. Is that a logistic issue? Is that a cautious issue? It may be a combination of things, but the fact of the matter is that not everybody's opening at the same rate. Uh, and I think that we're fortunate at this point that people are cautious, uh, and maybe that is what's attributing to the fact that we're not seeing surges. Well, there is, I think, a connection, and you mentioned the crowds returning to sporting events in larger concerts, venues, even if it's a political convention, huge crowds that sports leagues already are preparing to not have. But that's always looking ahead in the current climate. And as we've talked now for this being the 10th episode, the dangers you've warned about predictive models and trying to legislate something in November for a virus that could look much different, positive or negatively, come that time. But I do sense that, and again, I'll just use my area, but I can go to a Lowe's, I can go to a Giant, I can go to a big box store and see lines of people, hundreds of people. They're following the protocol. Everybody has a mask on. Some people have gloves, some people don't, but everybody has a mask and there's a big sign that says you can't come in without a mask. But there doesn't seem to be as much fear, apprehension, about going down an aisle where somebody else is in anymore. And I wonder if it's just going to be human nature that's going to combat medicine or data come September, where people are going to say, look, I've already been going to Home Depot. I've already been going to these big Walmart. Why can't I go to a a basketball game? Right. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think uh, the, the element of human nature, the portion of the human nature that's maybe uh, rearing its head is the fact that people are frustrated after the lockdown and are really looking for venues to get out um, and are willing to take a chance because everyone around them seems to be healthy and not sick. There's nobody coughing, sneezing, you know, at lows in the, in the line. And if there was somebody coughing, sneezing, or even febrile online, I think that the crowd would uh, certainly react to that. We see I sneezed in Lowe's the other day and people looked at me like I had another head. And that exactly. was a sneeze. That wasn't even a cough. Right. Well, a sneeze or a cough, uh, they're all going to be uh, looked at the same, the same fashion. Um, clearly, we are right now in the beginning of uh, or in the dead of spring, if you will. So uh, sneezing is not unusual, especially with the pollen counts that we're seeing. But regardless... I think that there is tension on these lines because if you stand in line without a mask, even though the mask may or may not be the one that's uh, protecting everyone around them, including the individual wearing it, um, there is tension as high as people get upset and uh, it's, it's, it's becoming very vocal. Uh, So I think that people have been under lockdown. 
Um, many people have lost their jobs um, and uh, you know life is no longer normal. Will it get, get back to normal? I think that when you look at whether it be sports um, uh, seminars, where they're looking at uh, other entertainment venues, everyone's sort of chalking off this year as a dead year, meaning in terms of, of crowds and people uh, being able to participate uh, on, on a location. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot that's being postponed to 2021. Right. So I think that hopefully by then we uh, we have a better understanding of this particular virus and be able to control also the concerns that we have with large crowds. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we've seen already some individual sports return. We've seen this past weekend, for example, golf came back, NASCAR, real NASCAR, not yeah. them yeah. in the simulators. And the big one has been UFC, mixed martial arts, where they've had three fights over the last week, three separate cards over the last week. So the conversation in the sports world has shifted now from initially asking, well, how are these leagues going to keep people safe to what can we do to get fans in the stands? But it's just an interesting observation that the individual sports have been able to return and there hasn't been – now, granted, golf and NASCAR have only been around a week, but right. the UFC has been around for a month now. Right. And we've seen guys in a combat sport go head-to-head, -head, fight in a ring, in an octagon, and we haven't had any setbacks. We haven't had – even one fighter this past weekend, his wife had COVID or has COVID, and he came in and was checked and cleared and everything. And it seems as if the – protocol for VIPs, if you will, has been put in place and can work. It's just a matter of making that large scale for the masses. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you've been exposed to someone who is infected or is a carrier does not necessarily mean that you become one. Um, and now, as you could see, what we've done is we've created a barrier, meaning you have to be tested. And uh, I'm sure that even if you're tested and you're negative each day, if this is a, a daily occurrence with a specific sport, you're going to be, again, checked for fever and maybe even repeatedly checked for uh, the, um, the virus. So I think that, yes, we've ramped up uh, procedures uh, to allow us to do this. Um, and so far, they're working. Um, and I think that that's what, I th that's what the population wants to see, is they want to see everything come back uh, uh, in terms of uh, not just sport activities, but their life and livelihood. And again, jobs, uh, especially in large uh, conglomerates, whether it be a factory or a big department store, uh, puts a lot of risk in it. Um, but we're seeing again that as even there, there's protocols now in terms of both the workers as well as the uh, uh, shoppers and the, the others who are involved. In, yeah, in we, haven't, we haven't seen many. I, I know there's been uh, a case here or there looking it up, but it would be front page times. It would be nightly news. If there was a breakout in a Walmart or a, a Home Depot or a big box, and I don't mean one person who unfortunately gets it and maybe even dies as a result, but I'm saying an, an employee who's interacting, but if they were able to trace back somebody getting it and then a breakout happening at one of these big stores, the insurance, the liability, all of that through the roof, they'd have to shut down. It would do a significant damage from a PR standpoint. I'll never shop there again. We haven't seen that. And I'm not going full conspiracy theory on you. I'm just saying it, 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 may be, it may be a good sign to bring people back in large scale down the road if, in fact, we haven't had that hit large scale in any of these big box stores where we see hundreds of people a day, if not in a span of a couple of hours. Right. Well, I think that uh, besides individual being tested uh, for sports events, as, as you just mentioned, um, or in terms of uh, serving the public. Um, I think the other uh, measure that uh, has been implemented is the uh, 
ongoing observation to make sure that if there is any kind of a surge, that that gets identified immediately and that proper uh, procedures take place. So it's not, um, if a surge occurs in, in one area in the country right now, it's not gonna be the surge that we've seen in New York City, number one, because we are trying to control the population. Uh, but at the same time, if it does occur, it will be handled very quickly and aggressively, which is what you want. So I think that the public's response to a very quick and aggressive measures if there is a surge, will actually be, uh, again, reinforcing the fact that they can trust that entity rather than saying, oh, you know, I'm not shopping there anymore. They'll wait till it's uh, gone and there may be other measures that the, that area puts uh, into place um, as a surveillance. Uh, so I don't think that, the, um, uh, that at this point, it's completely hands off. Uh, we, we are clearly, uh, looking at um, multiple steps to protect both those who serve as well as those who are consumers. So let me ask this last question here about the testing. And it's a simple question, but I'll explain why I'm asking it. Does everybody in the country need to be tested? And the reason why I ask that question is because I have a feeling, it's just a gut, that based on stories now that are coming out in areas that we're either highly infected or struggling to test people. We now have too many tests and not enough people coming out to get tested per day. Even here in Philadelphia, they mentioned that they would like to see a significant amount of more people coming out to be tested. So my gut tells me that there's going to be a story written or in the media, some it's probably coming as we speak, that's going to basically say, we can't get to a point in our society to return unless everybody, kind of pushing everybody to go out and be tested. But I don't necessarily know from a medical standpoint if that's necessary or if it's actually a good thing that less people are showing up to be tested. Because it's either one or the other, right? It's either people are now, well, I, I might be sick, but I don't want to get that thing jammed up my nose. Or it's no more, far fewer people are sick and think they need to be tested. So, you know, that's a very good question. And uh, clearly this has uh, multiple layers to it, one of which is resource, okay? And we talked about the standardization of the test itself and the uh, rapid uh, return of results. Um, it would be nice to have everyone tested so that we know what the prevalence of this disease is, and that will help us, again, ascertain from an epidemiological point of view how risky this disease is in terms of mortality, because I think what shook everyone is the high mortality. Um, but again, keep in mind, most of the mortality occurred in people with advanced age. Uh, and the question, of course, is what is the actual mortality? And you need to have a denominator, and the denominator is the total population where these deaths occurred. And you're not gonna know the total population unless you have an idea of the prevalence of that disease in the population. So that's a sort of maybe an academic, but it does help us understand this uh, pandemic a little better if we could get everyone tested. So now comes the issue of resources. Do you need to test everyone who lives in this country? And the answer most likely is no. Um, you need to test clearly those who come in contact on a daily basis with the public. And um, those could be, again, uh, uh, store vendors, it could, be, uh, it could be people in healthcare, et cetera, who have a rotating exposure to people who potentially are carriers. And you don't want somebody in your store um, who's manning the um, cash register not to be tested on a periodic, uh, 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 periodically to make sure that they are not again, positive in any way that they can now infect hundreds of people who come through that particular register. So that's just one example of where you wanna put your, um, your eggs in terms of that basket. But I think realistically speaking that the desire and the need for testing um, uh, everyone is going to die off as, as uh, we see uh, the economy open and people can actually 
move around without uh, risk or minimal risk and that um, the return to school and work. I think that that's going to probably put this, uh, put this aside. So that now, won't, had things. go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say, I, I'll slide this in here before we end. That won't be a reason or a factor thrown out to prevent a county, a city, a state from moving from red to orange or orange to green is, well, we need more people to get tested. Come on. Almost publicly shaming people to get out and get tested saying, if you don't get tested, then we can't go from yellow to green. Um, yeah, I think that that's uh, going to be very difficult for any kind of local government to be able to implement. Um, also, again, keep in mind that tests are not 100%. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, I think that there's got to be a combination of um, reasonable expectations, um, clearly the availability of, of doing the test, and then selecting... Uh, who you want to test above those who you don't need to test right away. Um, listen, if, if there were kits uh, that you could take home and uh, they cost you nothing, I'm sure a lot of people in the public would be happy to just test and confirm to themselves that they're negative or, or positive, whichever. Uh, but um, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. see that happening. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're, we're going to see more of opening um, of uh, life activities before we see the, uh, this majority of testing. Now, there's one last thing that I could tell you, which is, you know, there's a lot of talk about a vaccine. Right. And um, I, again, I think that there is some confusion in terms of uh, vaccinations also. Um, you know, we talked about in, in, in one of our sessions, I think we talked about the fact that uh, for the flu vaccine, you have to get one every year. So again, the question, of course, is how long that, um, that immunity, if you will, or vaccination actually is effective. Uh, on the other hand, uh, envelope viruses, uh, when the one we're dealing with, are not so easy to uh, get a vaccine for. Uh, I'm going to just give you one example. I don't want people to feel discouraged about it, but you know we've been looking for a vaccine for HIV now for decades, right. and uh, it's difficult to get that. So I would not um, jump for there joy. Are, just to speak to an area of a continued area of expertise for you, is there a or how much of a different battle is it when you're dealing with blood pathogen versus respiratory? Um, it's still the, it's still the virus itself. Okay. So where the virus resides, um, is clearly has it some impact, um, on how you, on how you, uh, address the virus, but whether it's in the blood or your respiratory system, whatever it is, if I have a vaccine that can, can uh, you know, like diphtheria as an example. Okay. Uh, if I have a vaccine, uh, that can protect you. Uh, regardless of where the virus resides. They all reside at some point in the blood. There's no question about that, um, you know, unless they're completely skin uh, pathogens. Right. Okay. But I think, again, that um, we have to be cautious uh, in terms of expectations, in terms of the vaccine. So um, I, I think that as long as we don't have one, we still do what we're doing right now, which is opening things in a, in a rational fashion and testing, which may be sort of a, an interest uh, step right now.